Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, we are going to explore a fantastical old folktale which might just might explain how coal was first discovered, that black gold under the ground coal. And this tale includes a wicked old witch, thousands of fairy folk, a wise old owl, but at the heart of the tale is a creature that we have not looked at on this podcast before, and that is a giant. We've investigated countless ghosts and death omens and wizards and vampires and fairy dogs and even a a phantom werewolf, but this is our first episode to feature a giant, and I think it's long overdue, because giants are a subject as old as time. Those large humanoid creatures have cropped up in everything from Greek mythology and the Bible, right up to the Lord of the Rings and the Harry Potter books. And in Wales, they've played a major part in shaping the landscape. Some say that the remains of giants hurling rocks and boulders about the place can still be seen to this day. And who knows, maybe, maybe they played a part in creating Stonehenge before it was relocated over the border to Wiltshire. Maybe it was the giants who relocated it. I don't know. It's as as good a theory as any. And they also appear in the most important work of Welsh mythology of all, in that wonderful collection of medieval prose tales, the Mabinogion. And if that wasn't enough... There's even a Welsh giant in the tale that inspired, arguably, the most famous story to feature a giant. And that is Jack and the Beanstalk, with the the fee-fi-fo fumming giant at the top of the Beanstalk. Because that story is based on a Cornish folktale called Jack the Giant Killer. Jack the Giant Killer, a name which admittedly isn't as pantomime friendly, shall we say, as Jack and the Beanstalk. But in Jack the Giant Killer, Jack does indeed travel around killing giants, hence the name. And this all takes place during the reign of King Arthur. And while on his travels, Jack visits Wales. And it's during his stay in Wales that a two-headed giant tries to kill him as he sleeps. But Jack outwits him and tricks the giant into slashing his own belly open. So not only did Jack kill the giants, sometimes he got the giants to do his work for him. But that's enough talking about other giants, because on this episode there is one giant in particular that I'd like to take a look at. For two reasons, really. The first one is that he has this very unusual origin story, which on the one hand is very fantastical, very much a folktale involving thousands of fairies and a wicked witch. But at the same time, this tale from years gone by is weaved into the Industrial Revolution in Wales. And also, and I've said this many times before, but my favourite tales, be they fact or fiction or somewhere in between, but my personal favourite tales are those which relate to real places that you can visit and explore. So after listening to this episode, you could, in theory, jump in your car and drive to where this tale takes place to the location. Well, if you live on the British mainland, you can. International listeners, you might have to catch a plane or a boat first, or or swim a very long way. But in theory, you can visit the place afterwards to see if anything remains of this tale, if anything remains of this giant. And very quickly, before I tell you this tale, this wonderful tale of giants and owls and witches and fairies, I should point out that while this is a very, very old folk tale, the version that I am going to quote from occasionally was written down by Richard Felstead in the 1980s 
I believe. I can't be certain because it was published in one of those lovely local press type books with no barcode or anything like that. So based on an educated guess, I am pretty sure this was the 1980s, maybe the 70s, maybe the 90s. But anyway, on with the tale. To begin at the beginning, our tale takes place in the Rumney Valley Cum Rumney, a valley in the south of Wales, which, like many of the other valleys in the area, was heavily industrialised in the 19th century for coal and steel and iron. But at the time of our tale, many, many centuries before, the valley is still an untouched, idyllic haven for nature and wildlife, which was only sparsely populated by humans but was very heavily populated by thousands and thousands of frolicking fairies, the Welsh fairy folk. And the valley is described as being a happy valley. It was the happy Rumney Valley, where the fairies lived in the caves. And in the summer months, they emerged and could be seen if you looked very closely because they were so small we are told and so light that they could shelter under a mushroom and balance at the end of a wheat stalk and during the daytime they were seen lazing in the sunshine and bathing in the waters of the rivers and the lakes and after the shades of night had fallen they'd emerge from their caves once more to dance in the moonlight And there's a nice little description of their moonlight revels, which tells us that they were holding hands in a ring of rosy circles as they skipped around to nature's night orchestra. It's a scene you can both picture and hear that sound of nature's night orchestra. So the Happy Valley, the Happy Rumini Valley really was happy by name, happy by nature but all of this happiness came crashing to a halt one day when a shadow a giant shadow was cast over the land in fact it was the shadow of a cruel old giant who had come to live in gilvach vargoid which if you are indeed one of those people who does jump in their car afterwards and go in search for these places is just a few miles north from the town of Carfilly nowadays. But this giant who cast his shadow over the land was as tall as the trees and his arms were as thick as their trunks. And he did nothing all day but hunt for food and lays about eating it, which you might think, well, That's not so bad. He's not stomping about smashing the place up or anything. All he's doing is a little bit of hunting and a little bit of eating. But the problem comes in. The bad news for the fairies who live in the valley is, well, it's it's more than a little bit of hunting. It's a lot of hunting. It's more than a little bit of eating. It's a lot of eating. And what he hunts and what he eats is fairies. The Tulloith Tig of the Rumney Valley with this giant's delicacy. And we are told that he was always as hungry as a hawk and his appetite was such that he gobbled them by the dozen. It's like taking a handful of peanuts or something, just scooping up a dozen fairies, chucking them in your mouth. And what a terrible fate that must have been for the fun-loving fairy folk. So let's move on to the next bit of bad news for the local Tulloith Tig, because if that wasn't bad enough, the giant kept a pet snake, which was curled around his wooden staff, and who, by choice, the snake would eat frogs and fish. But when the giant had eaten as many fairies as he could manage, he would then feed the leftover ones to his snake, who never said no to food, might might have preferred a frog, but never said no, and gulped them down with one snap of his mouth. So, as a result of this, as a result of the arrival of the giant with his pet snake, the fairies naturally feared for their lives and dared not budge from their caves. And who can blame them? 
But there was one fairy, a seemingly fearless fairy, who, in true Hollywood movie fashion, was not content with hiding away from this giant, because this giant, in one of his feeding frenzies, had eaten both of his parents, and this fairy wanted revenge. This fairy took it very personally indeed, as you would if a giant had eaten your parents, and like Liam Neeson in one of those Liam Neeson films, he wanted vengeance. And of course, while there was no way he could take him on physically in a fight that just wasn't going to happen, there was one way he could beat the giant, and that was by using his brain, if he could outsmart it. And in order to do that, he went to see the smartest person he could think of, the wisest person in the valley, who was the wise old owl who lived nearby in Pencoid Farm in Bedwethdy, and upon finding the owl in the farm, they spoke, because by all accounts, all fairies, so I'm told, are able to speak the tongue of the birds, and they hatched a plan. Which was that in order to get one over on this giant, they would have to catch him when he was least prepared for any kind of attack. And it turns out that the giant just happened to have a, well, I, I wouldn't say girlfriend as such, but he had a female acquaintance, let's say, who he would meet at midnight under a secluded apple tree for a little after dark romance. And this not a girlfriend was the local witch who, to quote, we are told, was the only person for miles around ugly enough for the giant. And the owl knew all about this secret meeting place and what they got up to. I mean, owls are nocturnal creatures. She probably saw lots of sights she maybe she'd rather not have seen late at night. Maybe she was in the very tree where they would meet underneath. But anyway, she knew that would be a good time when the giant met the witch. That would be a good time to strike. But of course, neither the lone fairy or the owl were in any position to physically attack this giant. And so the owl enlisted the aid of some local farm labourers who created a makeshift bow and arrow using the branches of that tree. And so with some branches bent in such a way to create a bow and another branch carved into a sharp tip and ready to be fired, which sounds like the kind of weapon which would also be quite useful when fighting off a vampire, a nice sharp pointy stake. But this weapon was now ready to be used. All they needed was the right moment at which to fire it towards the giant and to hope that it would prove to be effective. They had everything crossed, their fingers, their toes, everything crossed, that if and when this hit the giant, it would pierce the skin and bring to an end his reign of fairy-eating terror. And they didn't have to wait too long for the perfect opportunity to present itself when, one moonlit night, as the witching hour came and went, his lady friend did not appear at the usual time. She was running late, and so the giant sat down and closed his eyes to catch a little bit of shut-eye while he waited. And as the giant slumbered, the owl pounced into action, aiming that branch straight at the giant's chest, at this huge, snoring, unmoving target. She couldn't have asked for a better opportunity and had no trouble aiming that arrow straight for his heart. And after releasing that branch, her aim was true. It went straight into the giant's heart and he was killed instantly. The owl was so pleased with herself that she flew away singing a song of joy, a song of joy all about the giant's death. Because, you know, this isn't something owls get to do 
every day of the week. It's a once in a lifetime thing, if that for an owl, the opportunity to shoot a giant in the heart. But this owl had killed the monster who was terrorizing the valley, sang a song of joy, and we are told that even today on moonlit nights, her descendants still visit that spot in Gilvach to sing in memory of her great achievement. And if you are in the area, if you jump in your car and drive down there and you are there at midnight, you might hear these owls singing that song. But while that wraps up the tale of the giant and the owl, what about some of the other characters in our tale? What about his lady friend, the witch? Well, she did arrive eventually, and she also had a similar fate in store. When she finally arrived, she saw the giant lying there, dead under the tree. And with the giant now dead, the fairies were no longer afraid to leave their caves, and they hid in the darkness behind the trees, waiting until they saw the witch approach, and then they descended on her en masse. She was absolutely smothered in thousands of fairies, and as she lay dying on the ground, we are told that all of the apples on that tree turned sour. And with the giant and the witch out of the way, there was only one problem remaining, but again, not for too long, and that was the giant's snake, the giant's pet who died from fear after witnessing his master's demise. So in the end, quite a cowardly snake. And from the very spot where he fell dead sprung flowers from the ground. Snake flowers. Yes, snake flowers. That patch of land was now covered in purple and white fritillaries. A poisonous plant much like the creature itself. And which, if you do indeed jump in your car and go exploring you might just find growing in the valley today. And so you might think, well, that's all wrapped up nicely. What a nice little tale. The fairies have won. The owl has saved the day. The giant is dead. The snake is dead. The witch is dead. But there is one little problem. While the snake's body did turn into these wonderful, colourful flowers and the witch's body just turned the apples sour, the giant's body was just, well... It was just lying there. It was too big for the fairies or the owls or even those farm labourers who were nearby to move. And as a result, without being too graphic, but it started to rot. And to quote, to smell as evil as sin. Again, I'll leave that to your imagination. But this body was rotting. It smelt as evil as sin. And the only solution these tiny fairies could think of was to dispose of him where he lay. Rather than try and move the body, let's dispose of it right here next to the tree. And so they started digging a grave next to the body, and they lit a huge fire around it to try and conceal some of that foul smell. And this whole scenario to me brings to mind those Old photos that you might see of a beached whale washing up with all those little people around it trying to work out what to do. Well, the fairies of the happy Rummany Valley were in a similar position. And as they worked night and day, digging away, digging that hole in the ground, something very unexpected happened. The pit into which the giant was being lowered caught fire. And as such, as he was swallowed up by the ground, his body was burnt to a crisp. They had accidentally cremated him, you could say, which they assumed had happened by accident due to all of these flames all around them. It was only when their work was complete, when the giant was in the ground and they were ready to cover him over and never speak of it again, that one curious fairy hopped down into the grave and found among the giant's remains what is described as a black shining stone. 
he took this out and another clever fairy noted that this black stone must have been the cause of the blaze in the pit that engulfed the giant and blazed so brightly. As a result, the fairies gathered as much of this magical black stone as they could carry back to their caves, and from that day forth, their hearths were never cold again. And many centuries later, during the Industrial Revolution, humans would also gather this magical black stone from the giant's grave, and they would call it coal. And so ends our tale of the giant of the Romney Valley. I've been Mark Race, and this has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast, beaming to you from Wales to the world. If you've enjoyed it, please consider hitting the subscribe button, and if you'd like to support me and the podcast, please consider leaving a nice review, giving it a thumbs up, giving it five stars, whatever it is on the platform that you are consuming this on. For more Ghosts and Folklore, you can follow me on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And it's always lovely when people pop along to say hello. And as well as this podcast, I've also written a number of books on similar weird and wonderful subjects, which are available from all good bookshops, online and off, including Paranormal Wales and Ghosts of Wales, accounts from the Victorian archives. And on that note... It just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian am Rando. Enjoy your trip in the car to today's locations. And until next time, Nostar. No